Cameron, an ice cream shop employee with a talent for getting into sticky situations, finds himself tangled up with his mysterious and beautiful new neighbor, Diane. One morning, he wakes up next to her in bed, and they profess their love for each other, cue the romantic music and the heart-shaped clouds. But just as things get steamy, Cameron wakes up and realizes it was all just a dream. Later, his dad, Hunter, sits him down for a serious talk about his plans for after summer. When his mom, Carol, points out that summer just started, Hunter reminds her that Cameron already took a gap year after high school. So, he gives Cameron three weeks to come up with a solid plan for his future. At the ice cream shop, Lenny, the assistant manager, is not thrilled about Cameron coming in late, and he's be like, you know, ice cream waits for no one. Then Lenny asks him to close the shop that night, but Cameron has a date with Diane. Lenny scoffs, clearly skeptical that Cameron actually scored a date with someone as gorgeous as her, and he's like, you, a date, with a goddess, sure and I'm the king of the ice cream kingdom. Meanwhile, a mysterious woman appears outside the neighbor's house, adding a sprinkle of intrigue to the mix. That afternoon, Cameron's co-worker Liz is fuming because she has to close the store since he wouldn't do it. She questions whether he's lying about the date with Diane. Cameron explains that they've been friends for years, and he was the first person she texted when she got back from college. After work, Cameron stops by Diane's house and sees her lounging in a bikini in the backyard. Suddenly, Chad and Jason show up and accuse him of spying on her, causing Chad snatches Cameron's phone and tosses it into the street like it's a hot potato. Diane hears the commotion and asks what's going on. Chad claims Cameron was spying, so he tries to defend himself, but when he goes to retrieve his phone, a car runs over it. And he's be like, great, now I'm not just heartbroken, I'm phone broken. Diane steps in and tells the bullies to leave, and Cameron heads home, feeling like a total loser. That evening, he sees the mysterious woman undressing in her room next door, and she catches him peeping. At dinner, Hunter tells Cameron he won't buy him a new phone and adds that he should have stood up to the bullies who've tormented him for three years. Suddenly, the doorbell rings, and Cameron jumps up to see who it is. Peeking through the peephole, he realizes it's the woman next door, Victoria. Panicking that she might tell his parents about his peeping, he opens the door, only to find Diane there instead. Diane suggests they grab some dinner at a pizza parlor, where she apologizes for the circumstances that led to his broken phone. Minutes later, Cameron waves his friend Martin over to their table, despite Diane asking him not to. Martin stutters and quickly excuses himself when he sees Diane, leaving Cameron scratching his head. After dropping him off at home, Diane reveals that Martin stood her up at senior prom, and she still doesn't know why. To cheer her up, Cameron insists he never would have stood her up if he were a date. Then, she recalls the night he came over to her house and they drank her father's expensive liquor. She says she was supposed to tell him something she's never told anyone that night, but he fell asleep in a boozy haze. Suddenly, the man sees Victoria menacingly standing in the driveway, like a creepy vampire version of the Kool-Aid man. Panicked, he rushes back inside the house. In his room, he peeks through the curtains and sees her staring directly at him, like a hungry cat eyeing a juicy mouse. To his surprise, she appears behind him and he apologizes profusely for watching her undress. He explains that their neighbor, Miss Carpenter, is usually the person he sees through the window, so Victoria says she's house-sitting for a few weeks. When he opens the door to let her leave, she says he needs to drive her around town as punishment for peeping. Cameron reasons that he can't drive because he hasn't paid off the vehicle's insurance, so the woman tells him to figure it out or else she'll talk to his parents. Later, the hesitant man drives Victoria to an office building, where she confiscates the car keys to make sure he doesn't abandon her there. From the vehicle, he watches him and open the door for the beguiling woman. Looks like someone's got a hot date he thought. Minutes later, the impatient Cameron walks up to the entrance to see what's taking so long. Suddenly, the man from earlier limps toward the doors and begs him for help. Confused and scared, he runs back to the car and locks all the doors. The injured man leaves bloody handprints on the windows as he continues begging. Please somebody call a doctor, uh, uh, or maybe a priest. To Cameron's horror, he watches as Victoria bites the man's neck, ending his life. Yep. Definitely a priest, and maybe an exorcist too. On the ride back, he deduces that she's a vampire, and she threatens to kill him if he refuses to be her driver. Outside his house, Victoria kisses Cameron and says he needs to trust her. Trust a vampire? Oh, I forgot. Vampires are harmless. The next day, Hunter asks his son about the blood, and the neighbor arrives just in time to explain that she saw an injured deer slam into the vehicle last night. Then, the woman tells the father that she knows all about the insurance issue with the son's car, and that she's willing to pay for this month's fee if he'll drive her around while she's in town. And dude be like, looks like I'm the new Uber driver in town. Despite Cameron's many excuses as to why he can't, Hunter doesn't see anything wrong with the arrangement, much to Victoria's delight. Later, Martin admits that he stood Diane up at prom because he doesn't know how to act around her. Then, he asks the friend for help convincing the woman to give him another chance. That night, 
Cameron waits in the car while the vampire heads inside another building. Moments later, a person's lifeless body lands by the vehicle from several stories above, startling the men. Eventually, Victoria returns to the car, hungrily licking the blood off her fingers. Before heading home, Cameron makes sure to wash the blood from the window at a gas station. Hours later, the vampire appears beside him in bed and says it's time she told him the reason why she's in town. Victoria says she's 247 years old, and in 1890, a rival pack of vampires killed her lover when he refused to join them. She adds that over the last century, most of the pack members moved to America, a few of whom are in town, and she vowed to eliminate every last one. Looks like she's got a serious case of vampire vengeance. After learning that the people she's killed weren't human, the relieved man says she should have told him from the start. Phew, at least I'm not an accessory to murder, just vampire chauffeur. The next day, Martin asks Cameron to tag along on his date with Diane because he's too nervous. Later, Lenny's in disbelief upon seeing the employee hanging out with Diane outside the shop. That night, the man asks the vampire how many she has left to eliminate in town. Victoria says there's one tonight, and another that she hasn't located yet. She explains that the elusive vampire was the one who killed her lover, who was also their pack master, and she vows to make the death as excruciating as possible. Despite Victoria's orders to stay in the car, Cameron insists on accompanying her into the building. In the basement, Victoria confronts her target, but when the guy spots Cameron, he starts firing shots like he's auditioning for an action movie. Cameron crumples to the floor, and just seconds later, Victoria bites into the target's neck, defeating him faster than you can say, bloodsucker. When she checks on Cameron, he smiles and reveals he played dead to distract the other vampire. However, Victoria is not amused and admonishes him for the risky move that could have cost him his life. Before they part ways, Cameron asks her to swing by Martin and Diane's date the next day so he has an excuse to leave. The next day, Liz asks Cameron if he'd like to watch her friend's band play tomorrow night, but he politely declines. Sorry, I have a date with Destiny, or maybe just a vampire. During the date, Cameron fills the awkward silence by sharing that Martin is trying out for a semi-pro baseball team this year. Because nothing says romance like sports talk. When he says he needs to leave, both of his friends beg him not to, knowing he's the only one who can salvage the painfully awkward situation. Just as Diane heads to the restroom, Victoria arrives to pick Cameron up. Outside, the vampire asks who the woman is, so Cameron explains that he's been in love with Diane since freshman year. It's a classic tale of unrequited love and ice cream. She asks who Martin is, and he says Martin is in love with the same woman and he's helping out with their date. Perplexed, Victoria doesn't understand his methods. That night, Cameron points out Chad and Jason, who are outside the ice cream shop, and says they've tormented him for years. The vampire pretends to be Cameron's girlfriend and insults the bullies. The confrontation causes Chad to square up against Cameron, and he lands several blows. Victoria calls a timeout and coaches Cameron to hit the bully's ribs repeatedly, which he manages to do successfully. After Chad falls to the ground, the vampire concludes that since the bully lost, they'll leave Cameron alone from now on. In the car, Cameron says he thinks he broke his wrist, so Victoria hands him a small pendant vial from her choker and tells him to drink it. If you think, what is this? It's a vampire energy drink. After he ingests the substance, she reveals that it was her blood. And he's be like, wait, am I going to turn into a vampire? Because I'm not ready for that kind of commitment. She assures him that it'll only help heal his injuries. So, it's like a magical band-aid. That night, while he imagines Diane and touches himself, Victoria appears in his bed and says the blood acts as a male performance enhancer as well. Then, she suggests they do the deed to make Diane jealous. While they kiss, Hunter barges into the room, and he's be like, are you winning son? Quickly backs away when he realizes what's going on. When the vampire wants to continue the intimate moment, Cameron stops her, saying he can't betray Diane. I might have a chance with her now, and I'm not throwing that away. Victoria thinks he's being naive. The next day, Hunter gives his son a knowing smile as they sit across from each other at the table. And he's like, are you winning son? Later, Martin tells Cameron that the date fell apart the second he left. The friend asks him for help, but Cameron says maybe things didn't work out because they aren't meant to be. Sometimes love is like ice cream, sometimes it melts. Meanwhile, Victoria stops by the vintage clothing store where Diane works. After recounting the complicated web of romantic entanglements he finds himself in, Cameron tells Liz that he's done putting other people's happiness over his. Time to focus on me, myself, and my vampire girlfriend. So, he reconsiders Liz's invitation to watch her friend's band play that night. That evening, Hunter gives Cameron prophylactics after learning of his many exploits. Just as he's about to leave to meet up with Liz, he sees Diane's car parked outside the neighbor's house. Curious, Cameron peeks through the window and sees his crush hanging out with Victoria. What are the odds? My two worlds collide. When the women head upstairs, he runs back to his house. Meanwhile, Liz waits for him outside the concert venue, wondering where he is. Concurrently, 
Cameron spies on the women from his bedroom window and watches in disbelief as they share a kiss. Seconds later, the vampire closes the curtains and turns off the lights, and Cameron realizes they're about to make boo-boo. The next day, he sees Diane leaving the neighbor's house, proving she spent the night. After she drives off, the vampire asks if he enjoyed the show. And he's be like, not exactly the performance I was hoping for. He expresses his anger at her involving the one person he wishes she didn't, but Victoria snidely remarks that it'll never work out between him and Diane. You're just a snack, and she's the whole buffet. When he says he isn't working for her anymore, the woman menacingly grabs him by the shirt collar and states that he's in no position to refuse one last night as her driver. Later, Cameron tells Martin that he needs to go on another date with Diane and he'll make sure it's a success. Then, he heads to the ice cream shop and tells Lenny that he's quitting. Sorry, but I'm off to chase my dreams. And a vampire. Outside, Liz punches him for standing her up at the concert last night. He drops by the vintage clothing store, and Diane tells him that Martin asked her out again. That afternoon, Carol hands Cameron his new phone but asks that he keep it a secret from his father for a few weeks. Later, Cameron tells Martin to wear an earpiece during the date so he can dictate everything he says. The friend asks what he'll say if the woman finds the earpiece suspicious, so Cameron tells him to say he's awaiting an important call from the baseball team. Because nothing says romance like sports. During the date, Cameron listens in on the conversation like a secret agent, while Martin recites everything he dictates. After a successful date, Diane hands Martin the car keys and tells him to take her anywhere he wants. Cameron, feeling like a backseat driver in his own love life, orders Martin to take her home, but Martin has other plans and insists on heading to Lover's Lane. Oh great, just where I want to be, stuck in a rom-com. Exasperated, Cameron drives to the same location to try and stop the date. Behind a tree, he watches as Diane whispers into the earpiece and tosses it out the window, implying she knew he was listening in the entire night. But instead of making out, she bites Martin's neck, revealing that she's a vampire. Cameron drives to the ice cream shop looking for Liz, but she's not there. Seconds later, Diane appears, and Cameron tells her to stay away because she killed his friend. She says Martin's alive, shows him the men curled up in the storage compartment, and explains she simply made him stronger to help him play professional baseball. Cameron expresses his betrayal over all the years she kept her secret from him. Diane says she tried to tell him that night in high school when he fell asleep after they got drunk. When he asks why she hasn't said anything in the two years since, she reasons that she was afraid he'd react the way he is now. Then she admits that she loves him, even though she swore to never love again after watching every mortal she cared for perish from old age. As they share a kiss, Lenny watches from several feet away, probably thinking, I didn't sign up for this soap opera. Later that night, Victoria tells Cameron that she didn't know Diane was a vampire until she got a closer look and chose not to tell him because she knew he wouldn't believe her. And our MC be like, you think I'm going to believe that? I'm still trying to wrap my head around the whole vampire thing. Then, she reveals that the woman he loves is the elusive vampire she's been hunting and that he's going to be the bait. Sensing that Cameron's in danger, Diane arrives at his house. Suddenly, Lenny jumps out from behind a tree, says he knows what she is, and threatens to tell everyone. Dude, you're not going to win a bravery award for this. So, the woman takes him down and feeds on his blood. Minutes later, she and Martin barge through the door to confront Victoria, who's taken Cameron hostage. The women engage in a fierce battle, and when Victoria lunges at Diane with a blade, Diane shields herself with a wooden tray and throws the vengeful vampire to the floor. While straddling Victoria, Diane forces her to listen to what happened a century ago. She explains that their pack master was a vicious leader and she wanted nothing more than to escape. She met Victoria's lover, who told her she'd be safe in their pack and even gave her his blood. However, her heartless master found out and killed the woman's lover. After hearing the truth, Victoria apologizes and delights in the fact that she found a living pack member. They share a kiss, and she suggests rebuilding a family together. Vampire family reunion sounds like a blast. As they say their goodbyes, Cameron tells Victoria that he had fun killing vampires with her. He asks Diane why she has to leave, and she says it's time for her to move on. But I just got to know you. She knows he doesn't want her to go, but he still has a whole life left to live. After the vampire gives him one last kiss, Lenny, now a vampire himself, asks Cameron to tell Liz that she's the new assistant manager. Then, he joins the women and Martin in the vehicle just as they drive off. The next day, Cameron tells his parents that he plans on becoming a writer focusing mainly on the vampire genre. Outside the ice cream shop, he apologizes to Liz and tries to recount everything that happened in the last three weeks. Even though she doesn't believe him, Liz accepts his apology and lets him in the store. This movie's name is The Vampire Next Door, which was released on 2024 and got 4.6 rating on IMDb. Anyway hope you guys enjoyed the video, if you truly like it, please hit the like, and for more, hit the subscribe. I'm sure we'll meet again in next video.